The scientific community around the world accepts the theory about the formation of the Himalayas, presented by the German meteorologist Dr. Alfred Wegener in 1912. That was termed by him as the theory of continental drift. According to this theory, the Earth was composed of several giant plates called tectonic plates. On these plates lie the continents and the oceans of the Earth. The continents were said to have been formed from a single mass called Pangaea about 250 million years ago and was surrounded by a large ocean. Around 200 million years ago, an extensive sea stretched along the latitudinal area presently occupied by the Himalayas. The sea was named the Tethys. Around this period, the supercontinent Pangaea began to gradually split into different land masses and move apart in different directions. About 70 million years ago, the initial mountain building process began when the two land masses or plates began to collide with each other. And around 65 million years ago, this continued process resulted in gradual disappearance of the sea. And that led to the elevation of high mountain ranges. And gradually over millions of years, it led to Himalayan ranges rising further. Although the phase of major upheaval of the Himalayas has passed, the Himalayas are still rising at the rate of about 5 mm per year. This means that the Himalayas are still geologically active and structurally unstable. For this reason, earthquakes are a frequent occurrence in the entire Himalayan region. To make these geological changes understand in simple terms, we can take example of Batalic region. Where the fossilized remains have been found on the dry bed of the sea that existed in this region 200 million years ago. Another example is the mesmerizing Pongong So Lake that tells us about the presence of an ocean here at one time. Today, this saltwater lake captivates the visitors with its mesmerizing location, vastness, and the ethereal beauty where the water changes its colors with changing position of the sun and clouds. Initiation of agriculture was a gigantic step by the ancient communities to establish sustainable economy, thereby increasing the chances of their survival. Availability of abundant wildlife on the periphery of their chosen settlement was an additional benefit that could help these people to sustain themselves in case drought or floods ravaged their settlements. To trace the movement of these people, archaeologists have made use of distinct patterns of culturally identifiable creative work, such as rock art, to identify the dispersal of communities over a geographical expanse. Ancient communities comprised of few members and interpersonal attachment within such tribes was very strong. This is the reason why the death of each individual was deeply mourned. The graves of such people were constructed in a culturally distinctive manner, whereby the bodies were buried, employing unique techniques of funeral decorations as the dead were laid to rest in a specific position. The design and pattern of burial of the individuals in excavated graves help archaeologists to identify various tribes and their migration patterns in a scientific manner. Ladakh lies between Central Asia and China to the north 
and Kashmir to the southwest. It is a part of the Central Asian Plateau, a vast lunar landscape with desert climate where day and night temperature differs astronomically. This region is bound from north and east by China. From the northwest, an extremely narrow strip of land belonging to Afghanistan alienates Ladakh from the Central Asian countries, specifically Tajikistan. Further north of Tajikistan lies Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Russia and towards the west lies Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Iran. These regions witnessed the settling, rise and movements of Indo-European tribes through this difficult to survive geographical expanse during the ancient historical times. From available evidence, it seems that the first people to populate Ladakh were Proto-Indo-Aryans. These people must be part of the earliest groups of Proto-Indo-Europeans comprising of hunters and food gatherers who may be dated from 2000 to 4000 BC. The discovery of a prehistoric settlement in Nubra Valley had been reported by Dr. R. S. Fonia from Archaeological Survey of India in 1993. He and his team found various Paleolithic artifacts in Tertse and Hundar caves in the Nubra Valley of Ladakh. These wandering tribes must have arrived from the direction of Gilgit. Hugging the Indus River, crossing Skardu, they reached Gol, the location of the confluence of Indus and Shok rivers. Some of these tribes took the direction of the flow of Shok River and via Turtuk, they must have reached the Nubra Valley. They also encountered isolated herds of wandering ibexes and wild Argali goats, both the wild animals very well known to them, as they have hunted them all along the long and treacherous route that they had traversed to reach their dream destination called India. In Nubra Valley, they also came across sizable herds of wild yaks, who must be grazing on sparsely available grass and shrubs. Witnessing such variety of wildlife should have given them some relief and infusing some confidence for their survival. The discovery of caves of Hundar and Diskit can be attributed to such explorations. These were huge natural caves that could have easily accommodated sizable human population giving them much needed shelter from the elements of nature, especially during the winter season. The groups of the same people also left engravings on the rocks that are scattered in Nubra Valley between Sasoma, close to Siachen Glacier and other places. What happened to the Indo-Aryans in Nubra Valley is impossible to predict. They simply vanished from the region, leaving behind only few objects and rock art. To fathom how difficult the journey of these people could have been, we can take a cue from the records of Callisthenes' work, who was a historian and companion of Alexander the Great, accompanying him during his campaign in India in 326 BC. He mentions the process of crossing the Himalayas as follows. The army set off through the Paropamisus, or Indian Caucasus, and this move cost great sacrifices. The cold was so severe at the pass that one night some sentries were found dead, still leaning against the trees at their posts, their eyes staring straight ahead and their moustaches and beards encrusted with ice. Indo-Aryans must have faced similar situations, either while moving along the Indus or its tributaries or camping to while away the winter season during their migration. The description by Callisthenes can be true, as Dras, the second coldest inhabited place in the world, is not far off, and the region described must be bitterly cold during the winter season, taxing the endurance of any adventurer to the maximum. In India, Aryans settled in the Batalic region lived in their splendid isolation for a very long time. They were known as Dards. In Sanskrit, it means people who live on the hillside. Darts were well known to the outside world for their exceptional physical capabilities. Herodotus, a Greek, is regarded as the father of history in Western culture. In the world history that he wrote in 440 BC, he describes Dards as the most warlike of all Indians. 
and they were sent for gold in the district where there is sandy desert. He may be describing Ladakh as there were gold mines discovered in the region even at that time. After the arrival of nomadic groups, a new wave of Indo-Aryans between 1500 to 500 BC advanced, hugging the Indus River along Gilgit Skardu Gol and entered Batalik region, passing through Da Khalsi Leh axis. They slowly spread deep into Ladakh, even beyond Hemis, controlling considerable territory. When Indo-Aryan tribes must be settling down in Ladakh, the region must have been totally devoid of any population, very similar to Nubra Valley. After careful reconnaissance, they selected the best possible land to settle down, full of water channels, alluvial soil, and located on a commanding height next to merrily flowing Indus. These Aryans seem to have reached their cherished Shangri-La and must have celebrated their achievement in their characteristic style, dancing and drinking. Today, Ladakh is known by different names as the land of numerous passes, the land of mystic lamas, the broken moon, and the last Shangri-La. The four mountain ranges of Great Himalayan, Zanskar, Ladakh, and Karakoram pass through the region of Ladakh. Ladakh also has the world's largest glaciers outside the poles. It is situated in Jammu and Kashmir state and covers an area of 40,000 square miles, which is sparsely populated and mostly people make their living through agriculture and tourism. The climate is extreme. Rainfall averages less than 4 inches per year and winter temperatures can fall as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius. The landscape of Ladakh is marked by uneven terrain, valleys, rugged landscape and snow-covered mountains making this region extremely cold with no signs of trees and winds that blow at a very high speed. In 1974, the region was opened to international tourism and it is this aspect that is transforming this region. Majority of the towns and villages occur along the river valleys of the Indus and its tributaries, Zanskar, Shingo and Shiok. There is also the large beautiful lake Pangong Su, which is at a height of 4,000 meters. Ladakh also supports some unique species of animals and birds. And its ecosystem is one of the most fragile but equally fascinating in the world. In the agricultural economy, barley is the main crop which is turned into sampa after roasting and grinding. Apple and apricot trees are also grown and most of the crops are reserved for the winter time. At lower altitudes, grape and walnut are grown. The willow and poplar trees grow in abundance and provide fuel and timber, especially during the winter. These trees are also the source of the material for basket making. The fragrant juniper is reserved for religious ceremonies. It is burnt at several occasions by the Buddhists filling the atmosphere with its fragrance. The region is especially known for production of Pasham, which later gets transformed into Pashmina shawls. Livestock is a precious contribution to the economy of Ladakh, especially the yaks, goats, Bactrian camels. Ponies play an important role. Yaks provide meat, milk for butter, hair and hide for tents, boots, ropes, horns for agricultural tools and dung for fuel, thus playing the most vital role in the local economy of the region. The Zanskar pony is considered fast and strong and therefore used for transport 
and for the special and famous game of Ladakhi Polo. The original population is believed to have been that of Dards, an Indo-Aryan race from down the Indus. Among Dards, initial changes began with the advent of Buddhism about 800 years ago, when the first Buddhist monastery was constructed in Darchik village, and it exists even today. Buddhism must have initiated calming effect on these people and started very slowly transforming them, although some later converted to Islam. In eastern and central Ladakh, there are Tibetans and though over the centuries they have now assumed Ladakhi identity. Further west, in and around Kargil, there's much in the people's appearance and suggests a mixed origin. The Balti ethnicity is primarily Tibetan in origin, with some Dardic admixture. Communities of this region have embraced Shia, Sunni, Nur Bakshi and other sects of Islam. They still observe the Nowruz festival popular with Parsi and Iranian communities that clearly denotes their ethnic origin. What is similar between all the cultural groups is their cheerful nature and ability to live and respect the nature. Ladakhi culture has distinct imprint of Tibetan influence. Traditional music includes the instruments surna and daman, that is shahnai and drum. The music and dances of Ladakhi Buddhist monastic festivals are colorful celebration of human spirit. Accompanied by Tibetan music, also involves religious chanting in Tibetan or Sanskrit as an integral part of the religion. These chants are complex, often recitations of sacred texts or in celebration of various festivals. Yang chanting, performed without metrical timing, is accompanied by resonant drums and low sustained syllables. One of the most unique aspects of this beautiful region is its belief in Vajrayana sect of Mahayana Buddhism. All through the region, one can see gombas even in the most isolated and remote areas, as well as outside the periphery of a village on high mountains. Gompas are places of worship, centers of Buddhist education and place of meditation. Among some of the most known Gompas in the region are Alchi, Hemis and Thikse, to name a few and among so many. Another feature of this region is its beautiful dances performed by both men and women. Every occasion, whether it's marriage, birth, harvesting time or coronation of a Lama, New Year known as Losa is marked by feasting, dancing and singing. Of particular interest are the monastic festivals that draw considerable interests of the tourists visiting this region. Monastic dances are performed to celebrate the foundation day of the monastery or to mark the birthday of its patron saint or major event associated with the Tibetan Buddhism. These dances are performed wearing special masks and dresses and only by the Lamas indicating that these dances are both spiritual and mystical in nature. The historic journey of human communities in search for better life and landscape brought them to India when celebrated French philosopher and Nobel laureate Romain Roland said, If there is one place on the face of this earth where all the dreams of living men have found a home from the very earliest days when man began the dream of existence, 
It is India. Today, Ladakhi people add the cultural vibrancy of the country. At present, India as a nation is poised towards sustainable development. Despite daunting challenges, the people of Ladakh are transforming themselves while maintaining their distinct cultural identity and status in order to meet the challenges that modernization has bestowed on them. Yeah.